Hey everyone, welcome to the subtle art of keeping your service broker multi-platform compatible. I will immediately start because I have more than 30 slides and less than a minute for every one of them and I'm all against the odds because it already uh, took me half a minute to just say the title of my talk. I'll have three simple goals as part of my presentation. The first one will be at the end of this session, everyone, including me, to have a better understanding how we can build a service broker which is compatible with as many platforms as possible. The second goal will be due to the fact that this is one of the first breakout sessions that you participate during this summit. I will try to give references and uh, give some suggestions for other talks which I believe are related to the things that I say. So if you'd like to learn more about those specific things, you, uh, you can do that later on. And last but not least, I will try to set a very, very low bar with my presentation. The reason for that is because I believe we should always start with low expectations then gradually during the conference when we exceed our expectations we could have an overall great conference and awesome experience and all of that will be due to my talk and my poor performance on stage. I'm going to use the following agenda to achieve my plan. The first question that I'll try to uh, answer is who am I and why do I even dare to talk about platforms and brokers? The second one will be the why behind the talk or the reason that made me submit this, uh, this session. And the third one will be what are the things that I personally believe affect every single broker out there in case they would like to be uh, compatible with the different platforms. So who am I? My name is Georgi, if you already don't know that. I'm, I've been part of the Cloud Foundry community for three and a half years so far. So during my career in, in Cloud Foundry or as Cloud Foundry contributor, uh, my former team exposed uh, the so-called metering and aggregation service CF Abacus to Cloud Foundry users uh, by developing a service broker. So in other words, I've been into the role of broker author or implementing a service broker specifically for Cloud Foundry as a platform. Then the things have slightly changed so I moved to another team, which is actually a Cloud Foundry Foundation team, the so-called Services API or SAPI. And if you're not familiar with what does this team do, uh, maybe the first sentence of the team charter will help you clarify that. In general, the SAPI team aims to improve the developers and the operators' experience related to services. And we mainly do this. Uh, by adding improvements to the cloud controller, to the CFCLI, and to the Open Service Broker API specification. Or in other words, I've been also into, into the role of implementing a platform or Cloud Foundry. So then the second question, the why behind the talk, uh, was actually a presentation that last year in Basel my colleague Sam and I did with the, the presentation was with the fancy title one up to platforms three cloud services for whatever reason the people after the talk decided that I know what I'm talking about so they approach me and ask different questions and for majority of them they were into the following situation so they were having a service broker which offers their services to a marketplace in, in Cloud Foundry and they were looking forward to extending their service offerings to actually users running their containers in, in Kubernetes. And quite interestingly, even one of, of the people was looking actually for concrete reasons why their specific service and their specific broker won't just magically works and won't just be able to register successfully in Kate because his manager was quite sure that because the broker is OSBAPI compliant, it should just work. At the end of the day, it's OSBAPI. The specification is, is, is there and it's abstract enough and good enough uh, and both platforms support that. However, on stage and uh, when you're demonstrating something like uh, in the case where Sam and I did uh, as part of the summit where we showed how easy it is to actually um, 
deploy a single application without, application without any code changes to Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes and this application actually to consume services from, the, uh, from IBM Cloud, from Google Cloud and from Azure. Uh, however, when the things come to production and when the things come to different services and different offerings and different brokers, uh, the things are not as trivial as on stage and as on demo. And the reason behind the talk is simply to just give you the other perspective or the other point of view about what are the things that you need to consider if you aim for a broker that is compatible with the different platforms. So I'm going to start with a brief introduction to the common terminology that I'm going to use later in the talk. Uh, most probably most of you are already familiar with, with that, but there, bear with me, I'll try to keep it short. So Open Service Broker API or OSBAPI or just the spec, how we usually reference that, is actually a document. So it's a readme, it's a document which defines a contract between platforms and brokers. So what do we usually refer when we say a platform? So a platform is Cloud Foundry or talking or getting even a little bit further into the details, the component from the Cloud Foundry ecosystem, which is responsible for implementing the platform part of the specification is called the Cloud Controller. This is the main component which my team contributes to. The second component or the equivalent in the Kubernetes ecosystem is called the Service Catalog. This is the project which actually uh, bridges together the container orchestration of Kubernetes together with the concepts of, of the brokers and services and bindings and all that kind of stuff. So the next abstraction or the next main actor as part of the specification is the well-known broker. So brokers actually just advertise a set of services and plans via their catalog and they handle some requests based on some kind of user action which provision or create service instance which creates a binding or the, the equivalent destructive operations like unbind or deprovision or delete of a service instance. So it's a pretty powerful abstraction where you can fit a lot of things and you can ac actually connect those platforms where your workloads live to different kind of, of, of service offerings. So a typical example that a lot of people use to actually uh, give something concrete about a broker is uh, the MySQL broker or the MySQL broker, which advertise a service which um, creates a dedicated relational database for you and the plans usually are small, medium, some kind of t-shirt size plan. So once we have this common understanding about the terminal, terminology, what are the different types of brokers based on their deployment mechanism that are quite popular today? So the first type of broker is the one that I call and usually most of people refer as one deployed alongside the platform. So if you if we imagine that this is some kind of private network which the platform lives in, those service brokers are usually deployed via Bosch and they live right next to the platform in some kind of inner private circle or inner network of this, of this platform and they communicate or interact uh, together. So an example of such brokers is the service fabric or the on-demand service broker so usually they expose the, their service offerings via, via such kind of a broker. So the next type uh, of brokers are the one that live on top of the platform. You, most of people and most teams start with, with this because it's simple. In the Cloud Foundry case, you have a stateless Cloud Foundry application running on top of the platform and you just delegate or you just cut some resources for the users in case they provision a service instance or create a service instance. And the third type, which is kind of newer, at least for me, are the ones that are called uh, hosted brokers or some kind of central brokers. An example of such broker is the Google hosted broker, which is actually a single central broker where every single platform, no matter it's a Cloud Foundry deployment installation or whether it's a Kubernetes cluster with service catalog, actually registers this central broker and they are all sharing the same 
logical broker behind the scenes it's something running in the cloud which of course is some kind of distributed system but for the end users they look like a single instance of, 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 the, of this broker so then what are the things that every broker author needs to consider when they try to be uh, compatible with the different platforms most probably Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes so if you already saw from the diagrams, there are some specifics about the networking and this is one of the topics or the first topic that I want to talk about. So networking is quite, quite crucial. So if you remember the, the first diagram where we have the broker which is deployed alongside the platform and they're living in some kind of private network. Imagine this is a Cloud Foundry running on AWS. Um, and if we'd like our Kubernetes cluster to actually ac access that Cloud Foundry running uh, on a separate, let's have a platform to be a Kubernetes cluster running on GKE. And if you'd like to register that same broker in, uh, in the service catalog in, in the Kubernetes, then we just, the things just won't work because there won't be a networking connectivity between the, the two cloud providers. So you have to do some additional effort to actually ensure that connectivity. And today, if you saw the talk from Ralph on the keynote about the demo that he made, so basically those charts and uh, the diagram that you saw are some of the things that you need to take care of. So does that mean we should always aim for brokers which have a public endpoint or a public address assigned to, to them? Well, I could not say that. There are some pretty good reasons why certain brokers make sense to be in a private network. And I'll give a concrete example of that later on during the presentation. But in general, it looks like the trend uh, the last couple of months or even a year is the following. So a lot of companies, especially running multiple platforms, multiple Kubernetes clusters, are aiming towards some kind of centralized place, which actually aims to manage your brokers and connect your broker to different platforms. So you as a broker author just have to register your broker once in one place, this centralized control plane, and then the broker, this, this thing, this component is responsible for connecting it to the different platforms, applying some policies and doing some kind of other stuff. So currently there are two initiatives going into that direction. The first one is called the service manager. If you attended this, the, the Basel summit last year, most probably you saw a demo from Florian and maybe you have attended uh, the talk after that. If you're interested into learning more about the service manager, you can ask Florian or uh, <laughs> yeah, or you can ask me and I'll try to do my best to answer you some question. The next initiative that is going into that direction about having a single centralized control plane for managing your services is called ISM which stands for Independent Services Marketplace. So tomorrow there is a talk from Matt and Laurel with the title One Marketplace to Rule Them All. I will reference that in my last slide if you'd like to take a picture of when it actually happens and where. So the second uh, class of things that every broker needs to, needs to consider, at least from, from my opinion, is the authentication. So just a few releases from the last version of the specification, the only authentication method between platforms and brokers was the good old basic out. There are a number of problems with, with this technology because it's quite dated. And this is actually the reason why certain brokers somehow mitigate the fact that they support only basic authentication and they don't want to go public. So they don't want to have a public DNS route assigned to them and they prefer to stick to stay in some kind of private network just to not be exposed uh, to, the, to the internet um, and to not be protected just by a basic authentication. So the latest version of the spec is quite loose, so it's not anymore the case that uh, the basic is the only authentication method. Today, the spec uh, actually supports a barrel talk authentication flow. However, 
it's agreed upon out of bound between the platform and the broker how actually fetching the tokens, refreshing the tokens, revoking the tokens, invalidating them works. So it's somehow in a way a black box for the platform. Uh, and Kubernetes today supports opaque bearer token authentication. However, it's very tightly coupled to the way the Google authentication server works and it won't work with UAA, UAA or the AWS authentication server and so forth. So today, if you'd like to have a service broker which is compatible with both platforms, your, your only chance is by going basic. So I guess if it's an already known problem, what does the community do in this direction to actually improve this and make the things better? Today, there is a proposal with the title Declarative Authentication Flow, which aims to put some kind of standard between how the platform and the broker should negotiate the authentication flow. So it's not anymore a black box, it's some kind of different color box uh, in a way. Uh, and it should become a part of the spec, how brokers and platforms should, should handle this flow. But it's still a working progress and it will take some time until it, it makes its way to the specification and to the brokers. So, yeah. And uh, the third class of things that I wanted to share with you about what you should consider if you, have to, if you want to have a broker compatible with the different platforms are the so-called pitfalls or spec interpretations or something in this way. So due to the fact that the specification is written by humans, it's also read by humans and implemented by, by the later, uh, usually humans tend to have different or read the same thing in different ways so they make some kind based on their context or based on some assumptions that they make uh, which leads into different end results so to say so i decided to just put two examples of the things that i know and that we faced last year but there are plenty more and there are a lot of uncovered things between how certain things are done in cloud foundry and how uh, certain things are done in, in Kubernetes. So the first example is the service and the plan name. So the latest 2.14 uh, release version of the spec is quite strict about what you should put as a plan name or as a service name as part of your broker. So it must be a CLI friendly name and a CLI friendly name is defined as something that contains alphanumeric characters, periods, hyphens, with no spaces, no underscores, and etc. And service catalog actually enforce that constraint pretty strictly. So in case you have an underscore in your service name, the broker registration will fail. However, it wasn't the case at all in Cloud Foundry. So Cloud Foundry always allows spaces or ampersands or underscores or, or, or all that kind of stuff, which means that uh, you could have a service broker with, a, with an underscore in its name and it will successfully able to register in Cloud Foundry, but it will fail registration in service catalog in Kubernetes. So the things that have changed in this direction is that the spec is currently the late or the current work in progress version of the spec is quite loose. So it starts recommending some stuff and recommending a CLI friendly names, but don't force and don't have this must in there. But it's a pretty good example how, how you, you could be affected with such kind of, of, of tweak. The next uh, thing or the next pitfall that I wanted to show you are the limits or here the spec is not so strict about what you as a broker author should uh, have as a limit on certain string fields. So the recommendation here is that you have 255 characters, otherwise you compromise your compatibility with, with the different platforms. However, last year we worked on, a, on an issue in our team where we had a service broker which was successfully registered in Cloud Foundry and fails registration on another Cloud Foundry instance. And the interesting bit here was that they both were running the same Cloud Controller version. They were having the same API version. And when we get deeper into the problem, uh, it looks like the, the root cause 
of it was actually the relational database that was was backing up one of the Cloud Foundry platforms was different than the version in the other. The first one was using Postgres, the second one was using MySQL. So it turns out that for this specific field or for some fields, uh, some string fields, uh, the, in MySQL case it defaults if you have a string field and if you don't specify yourself a limit, it defaults to 255 characters. And in the Postgres case, it defaults to a text field which has an enormous or pretty uh, big uh, limit. So this is an, another example of how within the same platform, you could have different interpretations or different implementation details which could fail your broker registration and at the end of the day could break your delivery pipeline. Uh, because imagine there are some fields like which are generated automatically, like dashboard URLs or have some very long goods and you don't have control about how many characters you actually specify because it or you have a control but it's not so direct and still this could affect you. And the last thing that I wanted to finish my talk with is uh, or what are the the things that every broker out there should consider. Unfortunately, I don't have a silver bullet which will work for, for every broker because depending on your broker, depending on your product requirements, on your security requirements, on your service, uh, you, you could have different problems into providing a multi-platform compatible broker. However, uh, the things that will work for, for majority of, of, uh, of the users are know your audience or know your platforms and ideally validate against them or test as part of your continuous delivery pipelines, continuous deployment pipelines, te test against the platform that you aim to deliver your services to. Uh, there is a talk today, later on, uh, called testing production environments and validating OSBAPI compliance. So if you're looking into learning more about specific use cases or how different companies does validate that. I encourage you visiting this talk. I will reference it later. Then uh, the second takeaway or the second thing that should work for, for all service brokers are try to avoid as much as possible some platform specific context or features. For example, space good and all good only make sense in Cloud Foundry. So if you rely on those, those, those things, it won't work in Kubernetes. There we only have namespaces. Or if you have a service broker, which is a syslog drain or volume mounts broker or something like that, it's only a feature supported in Cloud Foundry today. So it won't work in Kubernetes. Uh, the next thing is that if you remember the slide about the centralized component which should manage uh, brokers and platforms on the one hand and the other. So expect more platforms in, in quotes in future. So technically speaking this centralized component which will actually bridge or will act as a gateway of brokers to, to platforms will actually be one or will be a newer platform in implementation according to the to the spec terminology so you could expect more interpretations coming from that there might be even some bug, bugs or some kind of false assumption that someone did a long time ago due to historical reasons and then this new central component just reviews that and and makes it obvious so this could is something that you should also consider and at least for me, it looks like the trend is more heading or heading into that direction about having a single centralized place for which connects different brokers with, with different platforms. And last but not least, uh, if you are a broker author, your best bet to actually know what is going as part of the specification is to participate into the community. Uh, so there it's a living thing. So it's constantly changing. If you attend into that community, you, we can have your feedback for certain things that platform makes sense and that platform think it makes sense to provide to their users. Uh, so your, your feedback as a broker author is very valuable 
and you can also be informed at a relatively early stage before the things get through the platform or to the platform uh, whether some some spec changes could break your broker and could break your compatibility with one platform or the other and it's a pretty good way of, of actually connecting to, to user groups the platform authors and the broker authors and on that terrible disappointment I would like to thank you all for your attention I hope you have an awesome conference overall and if you have any questions right now is the time or you can find me somewhere around I lack a talk or a session submission for the next summit so I, I'm very keen on getting some inspiration from the conversations that I'll have with, with you so here is the slide for the references that I gave you can take a picture if you'd like and if you feel interested into learning more about that uh, thank you for your attention. So you mentioned the declarative authentication flow mm -hmm. earlier, and you suggested that there that it would be going through some type of the standards process. Is that mm -hmm. happening within the open service broker? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the question was about the declarative authentication. Uh, so yeah, it's a thing that currently is standing as a, as, a, as an issue on the Open Service Broker API specification and there is a document with, with some findings in there which our team, the SAPI team did. So in general the goal there is try to put some kind of standard and this authentication flow not to be agreed upon out of bound between the platform and the broker. So in a way not to be a black box but just have some kind of of way to define how uh, or what are the supported authentication flows of the broker and whether the platform or how the platform could act to actually execute them or follow them. And how much should I read into the word declarative? Um, in, in general there are a couple of options uh, written there but the most simple one is that imagine that we have a swagger or an open API document which describes, uh, which is an YAML describing that, okay, I have a, an endpoint which should serve post or which should respond to post request and the result or as a result of that post request I should return some kind of body and some kind of flow uh, described in, uh, in an open API document about how the flow should work. There are a lot of uncertainties there, if I have to be honest. It's not a trivial thing, especially if you aim to provide something that is generic across the different authentication servers, because our investigation was actually... There is not much common between the Google authentication server, the UAA, the Azure authentication server, the AWS server, so it's so few things that are common between those, those servers. So it's not trivial to put some some kind of of, of yeah of a standard thing there. Cool. Thank you for your question. Any more questions? I guess that's not so. Yep. Thank you.